Hi, I am Amy and I'm part of the Growth Zone marketing team. And thanks so much to Malin from Insight for making this webinar possible today. Um, a little bit about me. I am a senior marketing communication specialist with Growth Zone AMS. Um, along with a lot of other things, I focus on research and analysis of association and chamber industry trends, content for membership professionals, and more. Um, let's see here. We're going to pop forward a slide. Yeah. Um, hi to our customers. Thanks so much for coming, and we're glad to have you. For those of you that aren't familiar with Growth Zone, along with many other things, um, I want to encourage you to join one of our online group demos to see our membership management software in action. So go to growthzone.com and the sign up button is right there on the front page. You should be able to see it on the screen. And let's see here, I have my checklist and we will also try to share a link in the chat section. All right, moving on to recording. We are recording the webinar. So everyone that registered is gonna receive the recording via the email address that they used to register with. So regardless of whether or not someone joins or not, they are going to receive, all registrants are gonna receive the recording um, once we have it processed and ready to go. Let's see here. It'll also include a link to the slide deck and any other collateral that's relevant to the presentation. And you should be looking for it in your inbox in the next 24 hours, hopefully sooner. We're just never quite sure how long it's gonna take. And again, we're gonna send it to the email address you use to register. And if it doesn't show up by this time tomorrow, check that spam box and make sure that it didn't get sent there. All right, so our knowledge library, once we release an on-demand version of today's presentation with Malin, we are going, um, it'll be ready for the general public and you will be able to find it on our knowledge library on growthzone.com. There are a lot of helpful resources on there, everything geared for membership professionals. And so take some time and check it out. Uh, we work really hard to generate content that's helpful, not self-serving, just out there to improve everyone's organization operations. Okay, CAE credit. Live attendees are going to receive one CAE credit. We will send those certificates via email, and that should also land in your inbox in the next 24 hours. The certificates will not have a name on them. That's how the system works. ASAE has said that's perfectly fine, and that that's not uncommon. Zoom. So I'm sure that everyone knows this, but just in case you don't, um, Feel free to interact with one another in the chat panel. And if you want everyone to see your comments, be sure to check your settings to make sure that they're correct. So it's not just sending to Malin and me. Um, if you have questions or comments just for Malin or me, you can see how to select that. Um, if there's a lot of chat activity, we will try to download the chat and include a document with that along with the recording. And additionally, if you have questions that are relevant to the presentation, try to use the Q&A panel so we have those separated out. Um, we will have a Q&A session towards the end of the presentation and anything that we don't get to, um, Malin said that she's happy for us to send her the questions and she'll follow up. So again, try to post those in the Q&A panel so we can separate them out of our Looking forward to robust chat. Um, one last thing, and then I'll get going. We have several webinars scheduled over the next few months, so keep an eye on your inbox. But we definitely want to invite you to Malin's next webinar, What is Strategy? And she's going to explain how to differentiate strategy from planning, turning strategic issues into goals, ex executing a plan, and a lot more. So mark your calendars for 12 central on Thursday, April 29th. And that registration link will be available soon. And you should be getting that in your inbox probably mid-April sometime. All right, so let's move to the reason that you are all here. I'm Malin Seit, who is joining us live from Kansas City. Um, go Chiefs. So a little background, Malin spent 25 years marketing high-tech products and uh, services with Xerox and Storage Tech. 
After leaving corporate marketing in 2007, she leveraged that communications experience to build her own company, Insight Marketing. That's a play on her, her last name, Malin Sight. Um, and as we know, communications touch every part of an association. And Insight Marketing works with member-based organizations to discover a unified voice uh, to convey their organization's value and relevance. So she is an expert in there and on our knowledge library, you can find a lot of previous webinars that she's put on that are really valuable. Malin's expertise on the survey process speaks for herself uh, as Insight. Can, uh, they conduct many surveys on behalf of membership-based organizations like associations and chambers. Um, today, she's gonna dial in on those strategies and she's gonna cover how to get more members to take your survey the actual questions to ask, formats to consider, and how to, uh, how to transition the survey results into action and a lot more. So I'm gonna turn it over to Malin and we will get going. Thank you, Amy. Can you hear me? I can, I think everyone Yay. else can too. I just, I just love to ask that question before I actually get started. So welcome. So happy that I can be here. Amy, thank you for having me back. You want to uh, pop your camera on for just one second and then make sure it's off and then back on. Awesome. Okay, we're ready for the slides. <laughs> Good. Okay, great. So again, thank you for having me. So happy to be here. Um, so, you know, we talk about this survey question and it's a really good question, and it seems like such an easy answer in, th in theory. So if I were to ask you, why do organizations survey? You know, you probably have an answer in your head. You know, is it get to know them? Is it to help you do what you do better? It's, it's just such a wide ranging question. So most associations say that they survey so that they can get to know them, members, their customers. After hundreds of surveys, we've probably done hundreds of surveys. Um, Amy, you and Growthstone can probably attest to this. A survey not only helps you understand your customers, like building credibility with your stakeholders, it builds credibility inside your association too, with your staff, with your leaders. Because the, the more you know who you are, the better you understand and unify around who you are and what you do well and what members think about you, the better you're going to relate and, and plan and communicate. And oh, by the way, did I say plan? We don't do a strategic planning session usually without doing some kind of member survey. We don't do a value proposition project without doing some kind of member research. We don't do a survey without really understanding who it is that you want to reach and who you want to hear from. So there's so much value to conducting member research for in, internally inside the organization and externally for your stakeholders. So I'm going to say, you know, I think this goes without saying, don't just check it off your list or don't just do it to say that you did it or don't just do it to look at you know, the top line, how satisfied they are, or, or by the way, how satisfied, how very satisfied they are. Don't do it to lump members in categories. Don't do that. Research is your homework. It's like studying your financials. It's like knowing your bylaws, but from the member side. So getting to know their point of view, your member's point of view is, it's as important as, you know, understanding I don't know, how would you relate it to? Like, it's as important as understanding the terms and conditions of your lease on your building. You got to know about the people that you serve. So if it is your job to say, for example, to stay solvent and make sure you don't spend more money than you take in, you don't just trust the numbers or trust them, the people that manage the numbers. You just wouldn't base a business based on trust. You run a business based on fact. And since the crystal ball is clearly in suspect right now. We learned well that we can't always tell the future. We have to find other ways to look forward. In fact, last year, I asked 100 CEOs this question. How do you understand about making decisions for your future? How do you, 
how do you make decisions? And 38% of them said to understand the trends from their members, to understand trends from them, to actually use the data, 26%. And then there was some that said, you know, I want to see if we've improved since last year, which is noble and important, but not nearly as important as what you can get from members that tell you what's going on in their world. And then there's other answers as well. So with that in mind, could we do our first poll, Amy? And um, let's find out where you all, all the people that are on this call, where you are on the, in the process of uh, conducting member research. So please tell me how long it's been. We have that poll up and running and we'll give everyone a few seconds to get their answers in. So just to clarify, like this is about an all member survey. So this is not like I surveyed about a class. I surveyed about our online conference. I surveyed about one thing. Okay. So excellent. Okay. So half of you surveyed in the last year. Awesome. And, and I got to give you guys credit. If you surveyed your members, um, an overall member survey in the last 12 months, during the last 12 months that we've lived through, I just, my hat's off to you. There were a lot of associations that were scared to death to do research during a, a crisis. And I suspect that you were glad that you did, even though you may have gotten some a, a little unusual feedback regarding the times, but um, just really proud of you. That's awesome. So those of you who didn't, okay, can we clear the poll, Amy? Thank you. Stop. There we go. Ah, ah. I'm just going to close this out. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so how about one more question for you? And that is, if you haven't, so for the 50% of you who have not done research in the last, you know, two years or more, just let's run another little poll for the, the answers that I most often receive about why not. So see if any of those sort of relate to what you're thinking. Yeah. We have the poll live. And again, we will give everyone a few moments to get their answers in. Yeah, I totally get it. Busy doing all kinds of things. It just kind of falls off the list. Don't have the time to analyze the results. That makes sense. Yeah, not much has changed. Ooh, wow. I guess, wow. I, I would suspect that a lot has changed in the last two years. Maybe not in, inside the organization, maybe outside the organization. This brings up all kinds of explanations, all kinds of kind of thoughts about, you know, really why? Why don't we do that? So excellent, excellent. Looks like, looks like for most of you, you are busy doing other things and it just didn't hit your radar. Yeah, okay. But still like there's some other things as well. Uh, the time to analyze the results, really, really important. Um, yeah, good, okay. All right, very good. So when I think about this, why not? And I hear about people who say, you know, our association already knows what members think. Or, or I hear this so often, only the really happy ones will answer and only the real unhappy ones will answer. Yeah. Uh, well, for each of the responses here and wherever you landed, I can show you a dozen associations that just don't let these objections stop them. In fact, they consider a they consider it like this business success factor to get to know themselves mem better and also serve their members better by asking the right questions and being completely objective with the feedback, not taking it personally, looking at it from a really objective point of view. When I ask that question about, you know, wh why, do you, why don't you survey? Anytime I ask that, 
And I hear people say, because really we kind of have a pulse on what's going on or things, things haven't really changed. I think of this quote by Anais Nin, it's so very relevant for this and so many other things. She says, most time we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. So I would say to many of all of us on the line to remind us that the only way to see the world as, as it is, to be, to be um, interested and attentive to what worries them and what they think is to ask them, give them the chance to respond. Especially today when there is one unintended consequence of research. Um, by the way, like research can tell you a lot of what you expect to get, but research can tell you something you don't expect. And that is, it can really give you like, um, what do you call them? Leading indicators of what's going on in your market and in your industry. And if you have those, you clearly make better decisions about how to respond. And then of course, it's safe to say that there is one group of people that can tell you if you deliver value and will also give you really honest feedback. And those are, the pe those are the people that pay to keep you in business. So today we're gonna crack the code with five key things that will help you get what I hope to be a really good payback for your next member survey so that you'll be prepared. So you'll know, you know what you're getting into and be more confident about what you're doing. So you'll be clear about why you're doing it and what you wanna get out of it. And then so you can be more open-minded. So you can really get ready to listen and question a few things that you're doing. Like I often think that if you're really ready to question everything, there's no downside to a, a survey where you ask people to really be honest about what they're asking, about what they're, they're seeing about your association. So here they are, the top five ways to do your research and benefit from the results. So we're going to talk about each of these five one at a time. First, Besides looking for any responses you can get, I would like you to think about being a little more thoughtful. To, so to be a little more specific about the responses that you get, don't only look at the results from this big diverse pool of members, all these members, because it will mislead you. The findings will be misleading. You'll get your first big payback on your survey if you decide on two or three groups of members, subsets of your members, whose feedback really especially matters to you. And here's why. Here's an actual survey chart from a, an association who does surveying every year. Okay, time out so I can clear something up that you might be thinking. So see the one at the bottom, the value you get from your membership, that is overall value. That is not your value proposition, that is overall value. So when you see the, the bar chart in yellow, the yellow is everybody. And this organization for, oh my gosh, maybe seven years now has been surveying not only the overall population, but they wanna see how the overall population compares to young professionals and business owners. So as you can see in the yellow, so the, the highest ranking in yellow is continuing education. So if you look there, you'll see CE is really important to almost everybody. And you might even take the reach that CE is the engine that builds value for this association. And if you only look at the survey population as a whole, you're not gonna know, look at the people in green, the business owners, that the business owners not only think continuing education is really, really important. And this association does it really well, but they also feel like legislative efforts are a real strong point for this association. So this is just an example to show you that you will be misled if you only look at the responses in yellow and you try to make plans and education and communications around the generic big categories, okay? So if you choose a couple of member groups that are really important to your future, even if these are really um, uh, significant, but, but um, hard to reach audiences, you will get the intel to do something different with, okay? So how do you prioritize who is very important? And I will, um, 
dispel the rumor that when, when I ask associations to do this, to choose a couple really important members, they will say to me, but all of my members are important. And I'm going to agree with you. All of your members are important. But for this particular exercise, if you only look at all members, the yellow bar, you're going to have some misleading information. So how do you do that? So I'm going to give you a really easy method to follow when you sit around the table with your stakeholders. Do not do this alone. So when you, when you do this as a group, we're going we're gonna to follow this graphic right here. And so what you're going to do is you're going to think about all of your members and you're going to brainstorm the key groups of members that are fairly significant, okay? And, and there's no like magic number here, but you're gonna probably come up with maybe 10, maybe 12 kinds of members. They might be like what I thought about before, young professionals, it might be business owners, it might be new members, um, it might be corporate members and individual members. You, it, the world is your oyster. Just be open and brainstorm. And then look at your list and you're going to say, who is committed full-time to this business? Because I'll bet you on your list, many of you will say part-time members. So as you know, part-time members are not full-time committed to the business. So they would come off your list. Then you're going to say, then you're going to look at, we can't reach our vision without them. So another group that often comes up in this exp explanation is our affiliate members. And while affiliate members absolutely serve a purpose for your core business, you probably won't reach your vision without them. You can reach, excuse me, you can reach your vision without them. So you just want to look at this group of people. You know, there might be like a small niche of members that you say, you know, yeah, we, we care about them, but they are not critical to our business. If we lost them, we could, we could um, move closer to our vision without them. We're not saying we're leaving them out, but they would just, they would come off the list as a high priority group. And then finally, we can influence their success with what they do very well. And there are some members that will clearly, they just, they won't use what you have to say. So if you don't feel like you can influence them, if you feel like you can't reach them, they wouldn't be your target market. They'll be an ancillary market for you, but not your target market. Okay, so this is sort of like a filter. See, like it's like a sifting flour through that filter. And when you get to the end, you're going to narrow this list down to two or three, maybe four, but you'll choose a couple of groups. Hey, I just wrote a blog post about this topic of segmentation. If you want it, there's the bit.ly link over to the left and it will be on it will be on your uh, handout as well. Okay, good. So number two. After you've selected your audience, after you've decided who's really important to you, I want you to plan what you're going to do at the end. I want you to plan for what this survey looks like in the end, okay? So these are some thought starters. We're not going to go through every single one of them, but there is something that I want to comment on, and that's the first point. What could be the unintended consequence of surveying right now? Right now during COVID, right now during dues renewal, uh, let's see, right now, uh, when you have a, a legislative issue that is controversial. So last summer, about June, we helped an association do a survey, in, and they happened to be in the early stages of a potential merger. And there wasn't a lot of information about this potential merger, but there was a lot of controversy. In fact, the association did not anticipate the level of controversy around the idea of a merger. It was only during the outbrief of the survey that they realized that even the board of directors were split in their support. And it impacted the way members talked to the organization. Like one of the questions was, if you could ask, if you could give any message to the board of directors that they will hear directly from this survey, what would you say to them? And there were coming out of the walls, concerns, anger, frustration around something that was completely unintended. So before you survey, agree on what you're doing the research for and agree what you want to get out of it and take at least a few minutes to think about what else is going on in your organization or in the environment to make sure to accommodate for that. 
even if that means asking one question about, in this case, one question about the merger to let people get it out of their system. Because when they have something on their mind, it will impact every question they answer. So that's the gem of setting out your goals in advance, considering the end game, all right? I learned most about why associations survey from association executives. So Karen, she's a CEO who's in the middle of a survey right now, said simply this, the survey is part of our effort to measure and improve the value we deliver. I mean, that's why we do it. We want to measure it. We want to find out ways to improve it. Those aren't the actual objectives of the survey. The objectives of the survey, so some things you might think about before you start your survey as you're planning. Number one, she wanted to identify any gains or losses. They do this every year, so they get to see the gains or the losses. Number two, they want to define or refine their focus, especially during this crisis. And they're, they're in a strategic planning cycle right now, so this information really helps that. They want to find out if their value proposition is still relevant. And if so, they want to know how well they pivoted during a crisis. So they add elements of their value proposition very clearly in their survey. So members will be able to assess that. And finally, their strategic plan emphasizes strategies for two big member segments. So the survey helps them to tune in to those very important member segments to see how the strategic plan is impacting these members' perception, okay? So when we plan for the end game, here's what I traditionally hear. Um, here are the three myths that I hear about surveys. So I just wanna get it out there. Number one is large membership means I need a higher response rate. We'll talk about that in a minute. Only satisfied members answer surveys well, many of us, I know you, many of you too on the line, uh, anyone who does surveys all the time understands that that is clearly not true. You have as many people who are happy as there are that are not. And by the way, the number three um, has to do with um, only satisfied members or only unsatisfied members answer surveys that we can't get a valid sampling through email. So we're going to talk about all of those things, but not one by one. We're going to talk about them in the, in, the, um, in the context of moving forward with your survey. So I want to talk to you about response rates. One of, the, one of the two things that I hear most, how many responses do I need in my survey? So before I can give a number, like I can't give you a number, but, but I can explain to you how to figure out your number. Instead of hoping for the best or setting an unrealistic number, I want you to set a realistic goal. So to set this realistic goal, you need to know a few more things about surveying and what they mean and how these metrics help you plan and plan for more than not just the number of responses, but other statistically important items. So first, confidence level means this. Let's say you survey 100 people. One, I would suspect that 90 or so of the 100 people, those responses are going to be, you know, reasonably objective. About 5%, one way or the other, are going to be either wildly positive or wildly negative. So it's really important for you to take that into consideration. Like, just understand that there is this we're confident we're going to get good results, but we're not 100% confident, okay? So many research sources say that this is like one of the most important considerations. So you get to determine if that number is 5% of the norm so that you have more confidence in the results. We usually say that a 95% confidence level, confidence interval is about adequate. We have some, some associations who don't need a confidence level. They're, they are just fine with a 99% confidence level with their responses. But for the most part, when we do a, a survey, we use a 95% confidence level. It just takes into consideration the really happy people and the really you know, pissed off people. Because there, there are people for no reason that, that um, just respond that way. So next, margin of error. 
So this is equally important. And the important thing is, this is about next time. Margin of error says that next time you survey this same whole group of people, you're likely to get different people to respond, okay? So if your margin of error is 5%, let's say, any ranking or rating that you get next year that is within 5% of this year's rating, there is no statistical difference between the two numbers. So whether your plan is a 5% margin of error or a 2% or a 3%, you get to choose that. We usually use a 5% margin of error because then next time you survey, you know that if something comes back in a 7% difference, there is a very significant change, okay? So now response rate actually means something. All right, so this is um, what I just talked about in a graphical format. So if your association or your organization has about 500 customers and your confidence level is 95% and you have a 5% margin of error, those are the metrics that you and I just, just discussed, your response rate needs to be for over 40% of your population to get a 95% confidence level with a 5% margin of error. And I know what some of you are saying. Some of you are saying, ah, oh, 40%, no problem. I have a small association. Most small associations get a larger response rate than bigger associations. They just have a little more high touch. Okay, but so we'll talk about how to modify that in a moment. If you have an organization with 2,500 members, you only need for the same 95% confidence level and a 5% margin of error, you only need 13% of your population to get a statistically valid sampling. So now these medium-sized associations are feeling like, wow, if I could get 300 people to respond, I can feel pretty good about my responses. This association that I'm working with right now that has a survey right now, and that's debunking that myth that association size and response rate are equal because they're not. With an 85% membership, same statistically valid criteria, they only need a 4% response rate. Now let's go back to this 500 member association. So, you know, you might say, oh my gosh, I could never get 43% of people to, you know, respond. So, okay, are you willing to live with a little bigger margin of error? Because if you're willing to, to live with a 8% margin of error, you only need 23% responses, okay? So just some things to think about as you plan your research, plan your responses. You wanna, and a lot of times what I'll do for an association is I'll give them three different scenarios so they understand that if they get you know, a 20% response rate, they'll have this kind of confidence level. If they have, they can go less. If you have only a 15% response rate, you can look for this kind of confidence level. This helps put context around the results. Okay. So um, let's see, down at the bottom, there is a website and this is where you can um, experiment with your confidence level, your margin of error, and your response rate. And that's a little website that will help you. We use it all the time. We just think it's important to be able to put some context around the responses that you're getting. But I just want to be sure that you remember that even if you don't get the response rate you absolutely need, there is value in surveying your members. But for statistically valid sampling rates, you just want to do your homework. Next, the no's and the no's of surveying. In other words, the do's and the don'ts. The next slide, I'm not going to review all of this, but I hope you're going to print and you're going to look at the next time you do a survey, you're going to look at and really think through the criteria you see on this slide. Okay, but I'm going to highlight a couple of things. So on the left hand side, the, the top five things that I, we see that are um, make for a less effective survey. And then finally, do not do these things. And I want to talk about a couple of things. Number one is do not ask leading questions. A leading question is this. Advocacy is the key to a strong industry. How satisfied are you with our lobbying efforts? Don't lead them to an answer. Just ask them the question. 
Avoid double barreled questions. How about this? Um, let me think of a double barrel question. It's something like this. How do you rate our classes and what would make them better? Okay, very simple. You keep the question very, very simple. And finally, you know, there are some members that don't even understand your acronym. I hate to say this, but this happens. So spell out the name of your association be before you begin referring to an acronym and spell out acronyms. Now, the first time you spell out your association name, that's the only time you have to do it. But be careful that you are not putting up an imaginary barrier of we and them in, their, in the survey. Because the survey, in a way, is a, is a method for educating members, okay? So to avoid um, survey fatigue, I'm gonna next show you question types for surveys. So this is what I like to refer to as the anatomy of an effective survey. There are many types of questions, many different, and, and different questions for different platforms, but these are the most common ones. And they include demographic questions, rating questions, you know, from very satisfied to very dissatisfied. Yes, no. And I always like to say, I don't know, because we need to find out people who just don't know the answer. Ranking questions. And then finally, verbatim or write-in questions, okay? So I'll just mention the first one. Let's talk about demographics for a minute because I'm sure that you already understand these question types. So if you choose two different segments to measure against your total respondents in the survey, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, assume that you're shaking your head. Yes, you are going to choose two segments to compare to your overall survey responses. You have to have a way in your survey to identify that group of people so you can pull that particular filter. So the democra demographic questions not only help you like find out general things that you may not know, don't ask things that you already know. You know, if you already know their, you know, age or how many, you know, transactions they do a year, if, if it's information you already know, don't ask, don't waste a question for that. But for example, if I'm going to have two groups of people, number one is going to be um, members that are less than two years in the business. I got to know which people are responding to the survey are less than two years in the business. So I'm going to ask and I'm going to say less than two years, two to five years, five to 10 years, more than 10 years. So we don't want to just ma ma make sure everybody understands that we only want to hear about members, how long members have been business that are very young in the business. We definitely want to know how, what, what are our responses? How, what, what are the categories that our responses are coming back in? Okay. And then another one, if you want to, for example, if you're another, if your other filter, your other um, target group of members is business owners, you would ask, um, you know, something like, are you a business owner? Are you a practitioner? Are you a um, independent business owner in a large firm? You know, you, you can ask all kinds of questions and then you can filter on that one type that you're looking for to get your, your filtered responses. Okay. What about verbatim questions? <laughs> this is something that someone gave me after a, um, after a uh, survey completed. And I said, if you had to do this again, would you ask as many verbatim questions? She said, oh my God, yes. It's amazing the little things that irritate or hamper members productivity. If we only knew those little things, we could remove that obstacle. And she gave an example. Okay, so not only are verbatims great for ideas, are they good for really getting a little second level information, but they're really good at finding a couple of things you might be able to fix right away. Okay, question types, verbatims, and you're going to have more of a robust survey if you make sure that you are all ears. I love this little dog with all ears. Because it makes me think, man, courageous. <laughs> that screams courageous to me. And the reason I think that is that if you ask a few courageous questions like these, our association has made changes for the better in the past 12 months. Yes or no? If this association, would, if let's say, um, if education was not part of this association's offering, I would still find value in my membership. Courageous? How about this one? If I weren't a member, 
I would be willing to pay for a subscription to receive your newsletter. How courageous is that one? So when you plan your survey questions, I want you to be a little bit courageous. This is your chance. You're the only ones that are going to see the answer. But I'm going to encourage you to be courageous. There's no better time to be courageous. Okay. And now about the format of the surveys. So if you're a growth zone customer on the line today, there happens to be a survey feature built in. And Amy tells me that it's a very simple survey feature. So likely it's not as robust as what we're talking about today, but for a class assessment or a targeted survey, or maybe follow on to a particular activity, you should at least consider it. Um, Amy, I think Amy might put like a link to that survey offering in the chat for you. If you're unfamiliar with survey platforms and many associations use SurveyMonkey, my company uses Alchemer and um, we have uh, experimented with many of the main survey um, vendors. We really like this one, um, SurveyMonkey. There's a very affordable option. Alchemer, I think there's a free option. You don't get much for the free option, but keep in mind, if you wanna get good information, and you want to make sure that you're able to filter it and you're able to ask the right kind of questions, you might pay a little bit for a survey provider. Okay. So um, survey platforms important. You're going to want to do a little bit of your research, but you know, if you Google survey platforms, you're going to come up with a ton of them. So um, I know many associations use, use survey monkey and we are very pleased with Alchemer. So there's a place to start for you. All right. Finally, Something tells me this might be why you're here. The big kahuna question. How do you get them to participate? So there's many ways to do that. We're not going to talk for hours and hours about this, but, um, you know, you got to ooch them. I, I just, I'm going to just say it as simple as possible. It's not a simple process. Okay. You got to sell your survey, just like anything else you promote. And if you don't think you're in sales, you are not going to get people to complete the survey. You have to sell your survey. You want to convince them that what they do is going to pay them back. Getting their attention is more than an email. It's more than an email and a link. It's not only promotion. You know, it's almost like anything else, like what's in it for them to participate. And some of the barriers are, you know, may not be confidential. If, they be, if they're honest with you, you might see that they said something that wasn't so positive. How about this one? I answer all their surveys. They never change anything. So you got to be willing to say you're going to change it and really do that. Okay. And more and more. Um, I love when a, a association president actually writes the introduction to a survey that lets members know why you're going to do a survey because it's member to member. So just, I just love that. I think there's a little more genuine um, interaction and expectation setting. So we have a more success on surveys with a true communications approach. So somebody in your organization should lay out a very simple plan. So first of all, think about what you're going to say to get them to take action. And then launch your survey with some kind of graphic for some way to get their attention. Number three, men, uh, mention how important it is in some kind of short, maybe a video update or something that's different. And then remind them, of course, intermittently, once a week, maybe, but don't only remind them because if you just say it in words, then they're going to skip over the words, like do some kind of cute graphic. I'm going to show you a couple of them that, that associations have done before and then thank them. Um, the associations that we do surveys for every year, members understand why to participate because it's a life cycle of a survey. They answer the survey, they the association tells them what they're going to change. They thank them. They give them an incentive. They do it all again. So members understand that they are part of this process. Okay. When you're going to ooch them to participate, graphics and images are important. So this will be in your notes. Remember this. I want you to remember this for all of your communications, but especially when you're trying to sell a survey. And then here are some examples of some graphics. So um, it can be a standalone graphic. The middle one I had to kind of blur out. The association didn't really want names or faces there. So I tried to blur it out. And then finally, maybe a little, a little GIF 
a little something creative that tells them why they should do this. You're a stakeholder. You have vital perspective. Win a $500 donation to a charity of your choice. That's the, the survey that's going on today, right now. All right. And finally, um, what kind of incentives? Uh, we've had luck with incentives like you got to, and sometimes an, uh, um, an affiliate can help you do this. Sometimes a member will make a donation for a little bit of recognition. But we've had incentives like an iPad, uh, something as small as a, a gas card, an Amex card. Um, so association dues are very popular. A year of association dues, you know, dues are, I don't know, $400, some that's, that's a major significant reason for somebody to spend some of their time. Um, we've had associations give education or event vouchers. So if it's, you know, going to be $50 to attend the next X, whatever it is, give a, uh, do a drawing for 10 vouchers. And right now is the first time we've ever done this, but we just wanted to come up with something new, especially due to COVID and the economy. And we decided to try um, donations to a charity. So three members will win a $500 donation to the charity of their choice. All right, so lots of things to think about. And finally, what do you do after this survey? What happens after the survey closes is as important as any step ahead of time. So whatever results you get, you know, whether it's the number you wanted, the, the, the uh, response rate you wanted, your results are valuable. So don't think that if you only get 100 people to respond out of your entire membership, that it's a failure. Review it anyway. You may not make big decisions based on it, but any information can be a market indicator for you. So here's what I suggest that you do. Number one, consider the statistics that we talked about. Look at your actuals versus what you thought that you would get from your statistical sampling. Next, compare your overall results to smaller segments. So you're going to pull your overall results report, and then you're going to pull a report for your less than three-year members, that one segment, and another report for your brokers. And as you compare, you're going to look at every question side by side. Okay. Next, the more that staff understands the results, the more vested they're going to be in change. So you want to ask them, and you want to ask them the following. Here's what we ask them to do. Read this report and give me five observations, your observations. What are five surprises? And then give me one short-term or long-term action that you think we should do as a result of this survey. This is not only a way to hold yourself accountable for this survey, it's a way to hold staff accountable for pay, being part of the solution, okay? And then I love this last one. The last one is asking, after you compare, or compile all of this information, by the way, there's gonna be a lot of information like observations are, we knew that members love our education. We know that members don't understand advocacy. We know that members love our staff. Like those are great observations, but really what you want to tell members are things that they were wondering about, like in a write-in or in some of, in a finding where you can say, you may not have known, but we, this is available to you as part of your membership. Like you want to give them something as a result of taking the survey and members, you know, you have a lot of involved members that take your survey, but you have a lot of uninvolved members as well. Okay. And by the way, if you don't get the response you want, one consideration might be conduct a follow-on focus group with our two most important member groups. That's a great observation or a next step. We don't have enough information. We need to ask more. Okay, year over year uh, tracking, really important. The best returns from your efforts come when you track your results over time, year over year over time. So this happens to be an association that we did their survey for five, uh, six years in a row. And so this is really hard to read and I don't expect you to read it, but you can kind of look down here at 2011 when we very first did their survey and you can see the red bar and then look how they have improved in their results over time. Now, some of the results do not have a um, statistic like a margin of error that, is, that represents any significant change, but a lot of these numbers are very different. So I like in a survey to ask an overall satisfaction question about the key areas of service. And these are the key, uh, an example of the key areas of service. 
And I want you to know how, I wanted to give you a target, what you should be shooting for. So when members say, I am overall 37% satisfied with staff service and support, the very first one there, I want you to know what that means. So there's a lot of research out there that helps to categorize, you know, really the most important thing is your performance over your performance. So year over year, your performance. But if we were going to say like all associations over time, here is what these numbers mean. Look at the bottom, the red or the orange arrow, which is 75% and above. And we do have associations that get 75% overall satisfaction with some areas of the organization. 75% is exceptional. And I will tell you that few associations reach this level. Next, 60 to 75% is very, very good. You are, if you get 60 to 70% of um, satisfied customers overall, you're doing a lot of things really, really well. 45 to 60% is about average. Most successful associations are at this level. But then you get down to 15 to 45%. This is problematic for you. This is problematic when it comes to longevity, when it comes to value, members seeing value in your organization. So you have some work to do in this area. And then, um, you know, once in a while, associations have this serious area. That is 15% or less members that are very satisfied. Okay. So this is overall satisfaction with the key areas of your business. And this ranking at the bottom are members who say, I am very satisfied. Okay. This is why you survey year over year so that even at a high level, you can see what members think from a very satisfied level, because these are the members that will refer you. They will stay loyal to you in the, in the, uh, you know, in, in terms of, you know, times of adversity or when you change a policy, these are members who are promoters. All right. So what do executives say? I'm just going to say, you know, we used to, we no longer look like this on the left. We now look a little bit more like this on the right. Um, getting together to review results and really talk about this is so important. So um, at the beginning of 2020, right before COVID, Insight Marketing launched a survey with 12 associations at one time. And it was 12 actually NAR, a National Association of Realtor Associations, different sizes, large, small, local, state, uh, very um, similar type of association, but very different in their construct. And we heard cons we heard pretty consistent feedback. The survey was motiva motivating to the staff. And then some of it was, we know we have work to do in a few really key areas. The next was, um, you know, the staff felt like they had control over the change that was needed. So it kind of gave them energy to work together to fix some problems. It sets an unspoken benchmark and really challenges staff to what to do differently. But you, this is not about every, like you don't want to give the staff your entire survey and like overwhelm them. Once they each do their little um, analysis on their own, that's when the real work happens. And then finally, feeds our strategic thinking. We can think more strategically when we have a few ideas, when we've asked a few questions about if, if the sky was the limit, what would you want our association to offer? Or, you know, questions that are sort of blue sky questions. So these CEOs did research in really challenging times so that they could appropriately plan for 2020. Of course, you're going to survey them. That's why you're here. Thank you for being here. But don't forget, you also need a variety of methods to listen to your customers. And often, this includes what we call in-process measures. So survey results are kind of final measurements. But in-process measurements are kind of like behavior measurements. So ju I'm just going to take like a left turn for a moment to tell you that there are other ways to measure, like a dashboard, you know, like a dashboard that talks about clicks and, you know, the, what members are actually reading. So, so you trust but verify that the survey results are valid, and then you verify with what they're actually reading when they say what's most important to me. So this is tr first trimester of, of 2019, and this is first trimester of for second trimester of 2019. So you track it over time. Just a few things that you track over time. 
This is the top click rates on an e-newsletter article stack ranking. Okay. And then, oh, I wanted to mention over here on the left. So um, this is so interesting. So uh, a CEO from the Midwest planned an event called Vertex because after a survey, he realized that members wanted technology information. They were over all this CE. They know they have to take CE, but they really didn't consider it valuable. So he created this event, that the, the staff created this event and members came out of the word woodwork because the association responded to member feedback about anything technology related. At the time, they really, really needed this. And it showed, number one, that the association was listening to their members. And number two, was listening to what members said they needed that they weren't getting today. Okay? So way different ways besides research or in addition to research to manage their behavior or, or trust but verify their behavior. And then finally, you know, there are very, very, like we do a lot of dashboards for associations and there are very simple ways that you can track trimester over trimester, quarter over quarter, how you're doing in terms of engagement with your members. So that is just a little bit of um, ideas for trust, but verify. You got your survey responses, you got your other ways to measure, take them both into account when you think about what you're gonna do next. Anybody ever seen this, this um, movie called Silver, Silver Linings Playbook? So this talk is about doing your research. And this movie clip way back, I don't know when this came out, but way back, gave me the idea that if more people did their research, they would be more credible, they would be more confident. I am not going to play this clip here because it's a little off color. And we just, you know, we don't do that in business at one o'clock in the afternoon. But if you want to really like get the bottom line of this talk about doing your research, being credible, earning trust, I'm going to suggest that you watch this bit.ly link. And by the way, take your camera, take your phone and take a picture of this. So you don't have to wait till tomorrow. As soon as we're done, I want you to play this. It, you know, you got to be willing to hear a few bad words, but it really is the bottom line about earning trust from the people that you care most about. We have done hundreds of surveys since 2007 at Insight Marketing, and I will tell you one thing for sure, that nothing stays the same. And it takes experimenting, and it takes pivoting, and it takes learning what works for you. So, you know, that's why conducting one survey project a year, you're going to get good at it year over year over year. So it'll make it easier when those of you who responded, I don't know how to analyze the results. Well, you're going to get better at analyzing results once you see the results next year. Once you see the results over this year, you're going to be able to get better at this. Um, there is a infographic at this link. If you want a absolute like seven question infographics that will help recap this, um, this presentation for you. Okay. And by the way, where you get that, you can just search for surveys and find all kinds of other blog posts that talk about some of the things we talked about today and some things we didn't talk about today. Okay. So this is the literal cliff notes and it's good to keep in a, maybe a keeper's file for when you're ready to conduct your next survey. Okay, here's a way to stay up to date with very selective communication ideas and experience experiments that we do here at Insight Marketing and the results of those experience. And um, we just try to help you. And so every month or so, we send out something that says what we tried and what worked and what maybe didn't work. And then finally, everything that you do from surveys to the words you write that end up in a very full inbox, by the way, is showing your value. And that means articulating what you do best that they do, that they need the most. So this is a workbook that can help you do that by yourself if you want to do it. It's seven steps and it tells you how to uncover and build your value proposition. Okay, so five key steps. Refer to this. It's a lot of information to get in 45 minutes, but refer to this, look back at it contact me. My contact information is at the bottom here. 
contact me if you have a question. I'm happy to answer questions. And with that, oh my gosh, it's one o'clock. Oh, Amy, I don't know if we have time for a question, but let's take one question before we let everybody go. And then how about we um, send the answers out and I'll, I'll answer them one by one and send them back to you and we can send them out. What do you say? That sounds good to me. Let's see, we will. I'm not sure, sure if you mine. covered this one, but, or did you find one that you liked? Nope, go ahead. Okay, I'm not sure if you covered this, but I do think it's worth repeating if so. Can I send the same survey to all of my members and break them down with the demographic questions or should I create a different survey for each segment? No, you, you always do one survey because if you wanna do year over year surveying, you're gonna use pretty much the same survey year over year. So that's the reason you're going to ask those demographic questions inside of the same survey so that you can pull out the very exact question, the exact questions for two different groups and your overall segment at the same time. So only one survey, save yourself some time. All right, so we are going to let everyone go as Malin said, but we will put together answers to those questions and get those answers to you. So thank you to Malin, of course, for it, um, doing this for us. Um, we're so appreciative and thank you to everyone that took the time out of their day to attend. If you have any other questions, you can reach us at marketing at growthzone.com. And again, you're gonna receive a follow-up email within the next 24 hours, hopefully with links to the handouts that Melinda's talked about and the slide deck, recording, et cetera. So thanks again, everyone, and stay Good safe. Luck. Have a great day. And thanks, Melin. You can do it. Thanks, everybody.